Hey, what's up guys? Chad Hermanson here with Metal Edge Training Coach. Today I'll be talking with Anthony Iaposi. Anthony is the hitting coach for the Chicago Cubs. That's right, he works with Chris Bryant, Javi Baez, Anthony Rizzo, Schwarber, all those hitters on the Chicago Cubs. He's got a great story. He shares that with us, uh, what it was like for him in the minor leagues and what it's like being a head coach and, and working as a head hitting coach in the big league. So it's a pretty cool story. So enjoy this conversation with Anthony Iaposi. All right. Hey, what's up, Anthony? How's it going, man? What's going on, Chad, man? Great to see you. It's great to see you, man. It's been a long time. So Anthony and I, we were, we were teammates in the Arizona Fall League back when we were youngsters. Um, that, that's when we first met. We were trying to get our – I think I had just a little bit of time in the big leagues. Uh, before I met, you were still trying to get up there, trying to do your thing. And Arizona, I, I went there three times. Did you go there more than one time? <laughs> no. I was one and done. That was yeah. it. I yeah. Right after double left. Yeah. I guess, I guess oh. when you go there when you're 19, you, you got plenty of time to, to screw things up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like 24 or something like that. I was like the old guy on the team. You know? Yeah, you, you were you were a veteran. I remember that. We had we had some good guys on our team. That was it's always fun. That fall league is if you ever yeah. get a chance to go if you're a player, you gotta go to the fall league. That's it's amazing. Yeah, just being able to play against or play with like guys like yourself and, and guys that you because you know, baseball America then in ninety eight was the only way to, to see how other players are doing. Maybe you don't know and you just read about people and then to be on the field with them uh, in the fall league, especially on the team is pretty cool. And then having, you know, Ken Griffey Sr. As, as the manager, that was too, you know. That's right. So that, that, just, that just reminded me of a story. So that's, it was kind of special for, for me in regards because that, this is when I got married. And yeah, I remember that. You, you, might, you might remember this story. So, um, so I'm getting married, and I, Ken, Griffey, Ken Griffey is our manager, senior, right? So that was pretty cool. And I remember going in to, to see him, and I go, hey, Ken, um, I, I need to – I'm going to need to miss two different weekends, one to get married. I'm having a reception and a, a small little honeymoon. I'll come back for the week. And then I need to leave again because I'm going to have another reception in Las Vegas. <laughs> so he's like, are you kidding me, Hermanson? Like, really? <laughs> so the, the funny story, though, I guess, and, and this is funny how this has kind of come up. Um, you know, I, I was raised. I guess you could say religiously to, to, you know, watch yourself with the girls basically. And so I got married. Did, we had our honeymoon. I came back and I hit a home run my first hit bat. <laughs> and I remember you guys were like. <laughs> well, could have been dropping homers all the time. You know? Yeah. Like marriage life's treating you well already. So that was pretty oh, funny. That was great. So man, so so we we come a long way. We haven't seen each other in a while. Um, you are now a big league hitting coach with the Chicago Cubs. So we're gonna dive into the how you became a hitting coach. But let's talk about you and your career. Um, what was you know high school like for you? College like for you in regards to when did scouts initially start talking to you? I think in, in high school, I'm from New York City, from Queens, and on the, on the last game of the season, we played the New York City Championship game at Yankee Stadium, which we won, and uh, just saying. And then a uh, coach from Lamar University was at that game. And I have no idea when Lamar University, they called me the next day, said Beaumont, Texas, had me and my dad had to map out on the floor, like trying to figure out the Atlas map. Okay, it's by Houston. That seems like, you know, okay, we see where it is. It's pretty far, but... Your goal is to, to play Division One away from the Northeast. I mean, that's why I went so long. I was hoping something could happen. Uh, maybe in that city championship game, somebody would be there from out of state. So spent three years there at Lamar. Got drafted in the 33rd round by the Milwaukee Brewers. And then just kind of each year went up the, the chain like you do. And then, you know, got to play in the Arizona Fall League. Got him to the 40-man roster with the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, got hit, went to AAA. And... Um, like I got hit in the face for the first time. You know what I mean? Like off to a bad start and you have all these thoughts behind you. Uh, you're struggling, you know, all these things that I never really dealt with before, how to, how to deal with that. Um, 
and then just kind of bounced around year to year for about the next four or five years. So like total 11 years in the minor leagues. Um, and then I got done playing. I ended up a couple of years with the Marlins in the minor leagues. And when I got done, I had knee surgery. And I said, we're not going to resign because I went on the run for like five months. Like, I'm not going to sign you, but you ever think about coaching, you know, give us a call. And, you know, you're like, what? <laughs> like, I'm still playing. When you're not ready to hear that call yet, right? Yeah, well, you know, so played a couple of years. Um, went and played my last year independent ball in the Northern League. And that's when I really started to think about it because I was definitely one of those three guys in their early 30s, 31 years old, that kind of you start mentoring younger guys, able guys who get released, some college guys, some six-year Frasian guys. And then you start thinking, oh, okay, I want to get into coaching. Not necessarily hitting. So that year, uh, we ended up winning the Northern League Championship. And uh, the Marlins called and said, you know, we, we got a spot open. Would you want it part-time in Jamestown? I said, yeah, I'll take it. Because uh, I was going to go to Italy okay. and play at Remini, but I decided to – to start coaching. And the reason why I went with the mom right away because I really felt comfortable because I knew everybody there so we could coach with freedom and things like that. So um, started coaching with the Marlins in Jamestown as a hitting coach, but the reason why I got into coaching wasn't because the pure enjoyment of wanting to be a hitting coach, you know, it was like, it was the enjoyment of getting players through the season. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, the ups and downs, the, the, the mental grind, um, riding the buses, helping guys be away from their family, those type of issues to where if you could, like, minimize those things as a minor league player and then so that you can truly focus on what you want to do, I mean, those are the reasons why I started coaching and got into coaching. Hitting is just kind of the, the route I went in and, and the route I'm in now. And then from the Marlins, we were stacked with a bunch of good players. Went, was a hitting coordinator for the Blue Jays for three years and then went to the Cubs when they started their rebuild, uh, fall of 12, and then spent some time there. And then 16 was my first major league um, with the Texas Rangers, which I spent three years with me. In 16, we won 95 games, the most in the, in the, West, in, in the West American League. And it I was like, man, this is hard. <laughs> like, winning in the big league is hard. Um, and now I'm back with the Cubs. So in actuality, this is like the first job that I, I tell people, like, this is the first job that I'm familiar with going back to an organization. Because every three years, our family just, just keep changing jobs and changing locations. This is the first time I went actually back to something uh, people familiar. So you could go right in and have cool conversations. Then, you know, trying to be patient and lay back and get to know the guys more. And pretty much, you know, how the organizations run because you were, you were there when everybody came in. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were a minor league hitting coordinator with the Blue Jays, you said? Three what, years, yeah. For our audience, what does that mean? What, what does that person do? As far as the hitting coordinator, you're in charge of, you know, hiring, hiring staff. Uh, you're dealing, you're like the in-between person between what's going on in the minor leagues and the, and the front office. Um, so you're touching a lot of people. You're in the mix with a lot of people. Um, but you're also in charge of every player in the, in, in the organization offensively. So, you know, you got seven, seven layers, seven, seven minor league teams. It's over 100 players. You're going to the Dominican. During the season, you rove to all the cities, make sure our plans are in place, maybe some swing adjustments here, uh, decide whether we're going to move guys up or down, whether we're going to bring coaches back. Um, you know, and I, and I guess your organizational people like to say philosophy. I like to say standards, like what we stand for. Um, as an organization offensively. And from that, you just talk with the major league staff on what type of players they need to help the team, you know, what type of, not necessarily impact guys, but how can guys help impact the lineup in different ways, whether they're hitting seventh or whatever. So, um, and really just, you know, with the, with the mental side of it, you know, that, that's a huge part of it, and, you know, expectations, things like that. So, you're, you're in charge of all those things, organizing spring training. I would say for a coordinator, your biggest times are instructional ball and spring training when you're, you're running around. Because then once the season starts, you have your hitting coaches with every affiliate. So you have to let them work. You have to let them do their thing. You have to support them, even though you may not agree with them at times. But you have to show that support. You just can't come in town <laughs> and change the whole thing. That's I remember that as a player and our coaches <laughs> just kind of – being upset about that, you know, so coming in and, and working on the field early with the guys and showing the guys some love and maybe working on some things that need to work too. 
and then just kind of relaying information from the minor league staff on what can we do better as a as an organization um, because your, your minor league coaches are the ones who are on the ground like 140 games away from their family so um, you really want to listen to what, what what they have to offer. Yeah they're in that daily grind they see what, what's working what's working well on sure. that note you know you, you say any uh, a minor league coordinator a hitting coordinator you come in you might spend maybe four or five six days with a team what does that look like when you go in and let's say you're, you're going to double a and you're, you're talking to your hitting coach there and you're working with a certain player the hitting coach says hey we need to work on with smith he's doing this and that do you guys kind of talk about hash it out like what do we need to do what kind of form a game plan there we form a game plan probably like four or five days before I even go in. Yeah. You know, you're talking with them, and if a guy's really scuffling and really makes, it, makes some physical thing, but then, you know, what I've learned is the majority of guys who were struggling, it was like something off the field or something that was bugging them that, that the emotions play into the swing and break down some stuff. And other, other than the guys who, you know, are constantly working on their swing throughout the year. Um, so, yeah, we set up a plan, come in, talk to them, hey, you know, this is kind of what we're seeing. This is what we're thinking. Um, you know, if you have video or data or stat, whatever it is that you might open up their eyes um, to a certain guy. Also, you have to remember who you're talking with. If you're talking with a guy who maybe not understands certain information or data, because everybody comes from different backgrounds and different educations. So you, have to re you can't just spit out stuff like me and you talking from a scouting standpoint, from a hitting <laughs> standpoint. We say every single day, 100 times a day, that this player may never heard it before and when just and they're like yeah yeah because they want to be coachable and nice you got to really make sure that they understand it so it's really just squashing stuff and making simplifying for them to to understand so they could go out and perform but there's definitely a game plan you don't want to you don't want to wing anything mm -hmm. uh, as you're working with the player and he's working on stuff um you may start to wing it like you know you're working on something you're like oh that actually works <laughs> like keep yeah. doing it or let's, because the player has to be in on his development, or else he's not going to practice um, fully and tenfold, like, like totally in the moment. So if he's practicing trying to please me, it's not going to work. If he's practicing trying to please the A ball, double A coach, it's not going to work. I would always tell players like, "You guys are too coachable. Like disagree with me." Yeah. But because I want to learn too, and you you, you got to learn from the guys who are in it and maybe struggling, or you learn from the guys who are doing good. So. Feedback from the players, I think the hardest part for a minor league player early in their career is to express themselves to coaches. So you want to create that environment with, like, freedom and not be judged, which is the challenge because that's the only thing we're in control of, <laughs> for them to open up and, and, and be able to not disagree with authority. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, because there's plenty of guys who are, are just doing what they told because that's just that's just what they think, you know. And, and then back in their mind, they're like, this is not working, but they're afraid of afraid to say it so you you definitely have to open up that dialogue with the players and like hey it's okay to disagree like let's let's get this this is your career we're coaches we're here to help you you know yeah so that seems like that comes from the the culture of the team right having that sure. plan having that plan together to put it put it together and especially talking to those young 17 18 19 year olds right they've just come maybe it's yeah. one year junior college or straight out of high school they go straight into that authority of, oh my gosh, dude, this guy's the big league hitting coach. Like, I better listen to everything he says, right? And that's, you find that's pretty difficult with the younger players? Uh, I would say, just, all right, let's just say from the big leagues, the veteran guy, everybody who's always asked me as a major league coach, they'll ask me, like, how is it dealing with veteran guys? It must be really challenging. I go, it's the complete opposite of what you think. The veteran guys ask the most questions. That's probably the reason why they're veterans. You know yeah. what I mean? Because they're trying to learn or take out stuff, put in stuff, and, and talk about whatever, life hitting, whatever it may be to help them play. It's, I think the younger guys struggle with that because, you know, they have their own sense, especially today because there's so much information on the Internet. Like, they're concrete in their thinking. And then you get to the big leagues, and it's a, just a – that's a total different game up here, as you know, like – the pitching you're facing and the travel and just the getting in a box of 40,000 fans every day, like that disrupts everything. So yeah. 
it takes a little bit more time for the player because the, the younger guys are a lot more quiet, reserved. They'll, they'll listen, but they're kind of still trying to feel their way out. They want to stick in the big leagues. They're trying to survive. So um, they're afraid of being sent down. So they're afraid to make changes. Yeah. And I shouldn't say changes are just adjustments, right? Because change is not necessarily a good word when you use it in, in coaching, right? You want to evolve and you want to get better. So the younger guys have a little bit harder time, especially if you're in a winning environment. So if you're in like, like this total rebuild, and you, you like you're secure with staying in the big leagues and like hey you're here the whole year like we're we're rebuilding we want to see what you got you could go out and make adjustments and things like that but like when you're winning you just you're gonna do whatever it takes to get a hit in the yeah. box so um, as the coordinator the younger guys are, are, are really easy because they're coming in and they want to learn so I'm saying like no dude you need to slow down like and and like just stop shaking your head every time I'm saying two seconds like I could be lying to you and setting you up. As a just as a joke, <laughs> how you would respond. So, right. um, but you learn so much when the young guys come over and you're a coordinator. Like you're, you're dealing with Latin American kids. Like I can remember in the Cubs when we signed Glaber Torres and Eloy Jimenez. You know, at 16 years old. So it wasn't even about hitting. It was like, hey, how can you feel comfortable in the cage? What we, what can we do to help you help you about your day and where you you need to be? And mm -hmm. like to those two guys. Like they learned English fast. They asked questions right away. It was really impressive, which is now you're just, you can understand why they're really good players because of these other things that people don't see. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So you are now, you're in Chicago. Um, we're, how many days away are we from starting the season right now? I mean, like, it's going to be close to 10, eight, eight to 10, somewhere around there. Like, yeah. During this time, it's like strictly day to day. Like you start yeah. looking forward, the, the day comes and bites you in the butt. Man. Yeah. So walk us through what what's happening right now. Is, is where we're at this the time of this recording? It's July sixteenth. Um, yeah. We're still in COVID. Uh, what so what's happening? Days. I didn't even know what day it was. So it's eight days. Eight days. Well, yeah, twenty fourth. So what's happening? You're go, you're going to the Cubs Stadium, Wrigley Field, to practice. <laughs> walk us through what's going on there. Yeah, so you get up in the morning and you have an app and you take your temperature and you fill out these questions every morning and you take your temperature twice. And then I meet a couple of coaches, Mel Sledge and Juan Cabrera, and we walk to the stadium four blocks. And then, again, they, they take your temperature again twice before you get to the stadium. And then, you know, every other day you're having a saliva test in the parking lot across, across you from Wrigley Field. Um, and then you go in. And you wear, you know, you wear a you wear a mask everywhere. Chicago's been, you can just tell they're very prepared. What happened early on with some of the northern states, and everybody in Chicago is walking around with a mask pretty much, unless they're like exercising or something like that. But you can't go in anywhere without a mask. So you go into the stadium, you wear your mask everywhere, and it's kind of like as you start to go down to the locker room, total different entry now. Um, and right in the concourse, there's a weight room. Okay. You know, okay. Try to move everything outside, right? <laughs> things spaced out and then you go downstairs you mask on and you have the coaches and we, we try not to crowd each other like a couple coaches come in other coaches leave you walk through the locker room and um yeah it's a different beast you know there's makeshift <laughs> locker room. we're using the, the road side um we have two cages on the home side one on the visiting side they were using when the visiting teams are not here and we had one built on top on the concourse as well. So there's two weight rooms on the concourse with the batting cage as well, which is now where the cafeteria is. Okay. So go to where you would buy hot dogs. And that's kind of where our, our, our nutritionist and our chef is and, and they provide the food or you know you have the refrigerator with the snacks and, and juices and things like that. And then you walk onto the stadium behind home plate and this table set up for people to spread out and, and eat. So the, the, Chicago's done a tremendous job. The Cubs have done a tremendous job uh, trying to navigate this. And then Andy Green has been incredible as a bench coach making the schedule. And he can make the schedule, and then something could happen with the testing. Maybe certain people, you know, we have to push our, our uh, schedule back a couple hours or push it up a couple hours the night before. You know, you know how routine baseball players are. <laughs> The one thing that I always tried to teach guys in minor leagues was like chaos training. Like, you know, what happens if you're, it's raining or your routine gets messed up when you have to rush out to the field? This is basically yeah. what this is. You know, it's guys preparing 
with less. And so the, the coaches wear the masks on the field. The players have the option on the field. And then as they go in, they mask up. They've been, they've been tremendous. Our guys have been tremendous wearing their mask all around the, the clubhouse and the stadium. And then you get in and you get out, especially as players. We don't, we don't want them there as, as long as we need to. Get you working, get out, because um, you don't want to have the more people you have in certain spaces. So you're only allow a certain amount of people in, in certain amount of rooms at one time. Mm -hmm. um, did a media thing the other day on a Zoom. And that was interesting with the reporters. So it was like futuristic, man. Like, <laughs> like you were doing, but I'm talking to 10 reporters. Yeah. They're, they're working from, from up top. You don't see them. Okay. Which I'm sure the players don't mind. But I'm sure but they I'm love sure. that, right? <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to worry about going to the clubhouse and then, like, letting the loss or bad at, bad at bat sink in and then have to face the media, like, right there in your face. So they seem they seem they're not too upset about that, the yeah. players pretty good and then we started playing inner squads like no fans you know they got the walk out we're doing everything we can to try and make it but let's face it it's it's not normal like i'm in the cage with a mask talking to players about hitting or the pitcher or whatever it's just it's not normal and it's it's you know it's in the back of your mind all the time and i think people take for granted like just because these guys are like super athletes at the highest level like this is an issue like emotionally or mentally for everybody because everybody's dealing with it the same way. But I think the one thing that is impressive about these players with the Cubs is, like, they've prepared for this in the last five years, like playing with Joe Madden, um, you know, less work on the field. And then also the Wrigley Day games, you know, from playing there. That's a beast in its own thing. So they've learned to manage their time and, and do that stuff. Uh, right now they're learning how to, like, organize it again, how to do it. So – um, and then you really roll with it. That's one of the things about baseball is like you, you roll with the punches and you keep so many life lessons in it. So these guys are just, you just, it's such a sport that you just can't control anything. So that's kind of how we're going about it. Follow the protocol and then we'll, we'll just day to day, man. We'll just see what <laughs> hey, you get an email from, from Andy Green and like it changed again, you know, you had to make adjustments and he's, He's doing a tremendous job because that's that's not an easy job right now is to be the, the lead um, making schedules and making sure everybody gets their work in. Yeah, no doubt. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you have obviously being a Cub, you have some amazing hitters on this team. What <laughs> what is it like working with you got Javi Baez, Chris Bryant, Rizzo? I mean, the whole the whole lineup basically whole lineup. Yeah. is what what are some commonalities that they have? You know, I, I get a lot of inquiries about you know, especially if it's a father from a high school kid, they, they want to know about, hey, man, should I, should I be teaching my kid to hit the ball in the air? You know, should I be doing this and that? What, what's your thoughts on what are big leaguers trying to do? I, I really wish people could see behind the curtain their routines. One is the intentfulness behind what they've practiced. That is the, that is the separator between big leagues and minor leagues. It's not the talent. It's not the swing. It's not the – velocity it's it's the attentfulness behind the practice and why they're doing things and how they're doing things they're just they're just not doing drills or machine work just to do it because it's good work for them like mm -hmm. there's the thoughtful and, and you really don't know what they're thinking until they express it but then you know you know as a, it's like sometimes it's hard to express the things you're feeling and you're working on does not make sense to the average person yeah you know swing down swing up stay inside get on top sit on pitches like People are like, well, that's not how it works. Yeah, but that's how it works. My thought process works for me in order for my swing to be the most efficient swing for me to get the most hits I possibly can. Yeah. Um, I would recommend it to parents. Like, it's such a, it's such a, and this is crazy, man, because this is sports, and you're talking about amateur baseball. It's so hectic out there. Like, I go around more talking to parents in New York. Um, and trying to calm them down about everything <laughs> and just doing extra, you know, extra clinics in the winter, you know, staying involved or whatever. But I'm more concerned with the parents, you know, because they're spending all, a lot, a lot of dollars, a lot of money. Right. I mean, I've done it. I've done lessons in training teams, but the one thing that I always try to do when I'm training little kids or, or, or teams is to put game like mentality in their practice as well. And not, yeah. you know, you know, visualizing, anticipation, all these things that makes you hit the ball. Like, 
you don't just see the ball and hit it. You're visualizing it before it happens. It's coming too fast for it to actually happen. So for me, it's, it's more about just solid quality contact. Mm-hmm. You're at, you're at the lower level, solid quality contact. Have them enjoy the game, not be over instructional, instructional, not be over coachable at young age. Like, how could the 9, 10, 11, 12 year old be training the same way as Jason Hayward? That's I, insane. I agree 100%. That makes no sense to me. Yeah. Because when you ask the major league players, they weren't doing that at that age. No. You know, they were, they were enjoying being a kid. They were playing all sports, they were playing in the yard, playing multiple different sports. And the one thing I try to tell people, like, if you could play other sports, I would highly recommend it because baseball is a non-contact sport. So when you play, whether it's, you, even if you play through high school or whatever, you're playing soccer, football, basketball, lacrosse, whatever it may be, there's some physical contact and emotions that you have to learn to do. Yeah. Um, be able to shove somebody, get away. All these things factor in the co- competition. In baseball, you, you don't get that. And it's such a, it's such a mental a uh, skill game. It's a, it's a skill sport. You know what I mean? Than just a physical sport. So in order to have a skill, you gotta have a, a sharp mind and be handle your emotions. So as far as a um, a hitting perspective, I would like quality contact. Stay through the middle of the field. Don't worry about the power or and and hitting the ball in the air. Look, nobody's trying to hit the ball on the ground. Like, you know what I mean? I have to hit the ball on a line in the air to get it past the into the over the infield. Like right. even as a kid. Yeah, I'm playing stickball in the streets. I'm not hitting ground balls past the guy. I'm trying to hit hit the ball hard where nobody's playing. So um, I think there's a there's a there's a it's kind of a weird persona out there about hitting the ball on the ground. Like I have major league guys that tell me, hey, in BP, I'm hitting 15 ground balls. You're talking about major league all stars mm-hmm. in their practice because they feel like they're pulling off or they're underneath too much. The, the, the elevated fastball is the most elevated fastball thrown in the history of baseball. I need to learn to hit this elevated fastball. So the only way I can do it is to hit the ball on the ground. That's just practice. That's not the end result and I want a game. But if I'm able to do that and get on top and practice, hit the ball on the ground, I stay through it, that ball will end up going in the air and backspinning on a line drive somewhere. So um, I think the one thing that we're craving in baseball is contact. You talk to any coach in the dugout, contact, like people are craving contact. And I think you're only going to crave it even more in the next five years because the strikeouts aren't going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. They'll hit us adapt to what pitchers are doing to them, which is the elevated fastball. Um, you have guys throwing 88 at the top of the zone and guys are just right underneath it. They're just not going to sink it anymore. Like, you know, we're playing sinkers, cutters, see them up, see them up, see them up. There's, it's starting to trend, you know, where guys are just throwing 88 at the top of the zone and uh, pop it up. Our guy Kyle Hendricks, you know, started digging in and, and digging in. He's a sinker. He's a sinker changeup, mix it up type guy. Uh, he starts throwing in the top of the zone. He's like, if I can get one pitch at the top and have a guy to pop it up, I could stay in the game longer. Like, yeah. I mean, he's the professor, you know. So, yeah. um, for youth, it's like don't get caught up in like measuring your velocity or launch angle. Like, make sure you're really trying to harness your craft in the swing in the cage in the backyard or whatever it is, I mean, our, our players, when they practice, they don't want to learn or they don't want to chase exit velocity in the cage because they feel like they're going to overswing. They feel like they're going to pull off. They want to get what their mind and body are trying to do and try to feel. And even if it's a little line drive, yeah, we know that's probably not a hit, but it's about the process going into the swing and not necessarily the, the result of the practice. So I really wish people could see um, – behind the curtain of how intentful it's not that I always like to say it's not the drill that fixes the player it's a thought process during the drill that improves the player so you know somebody sees Anthony Rizzo doing his high T neck drill right and he's just pitting balls into the ground and and oh I'm gonna take my son I'm gonna do the Anthony Rizzo drill and it's like you could do it mm-hmm. you're not gonna be Anthony Rizzo you better talk to him about why and what how he's doing it you know, I'm just a guy putting the ball on the tee. I could relay you the information, but until you hear it from the major league player and why, uh, how he's doing it, not what he's doing it, but, but why and how is what the questions that need to be asked more than, than drill. Because friends of mine that have kids always ask, what's the best drill? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Every drill is decently really good if the player understands why he's doing it and what he needs to get out of it. 
Mm-hmm. You got to ask the parents need to ask more questions. Sure. Yeah, and, and and a lot of guys, for example, that I've heard about, say Chase Utley, as an example, I heard that talking to Aaron Rowan, he said the only drill he did was the high tee, and, right. and and you could see in his practice swing, he would take a pitch, step out, and he was swinging straight down, um, kind of down and then level through it. Yeah. And that was his thought process. He's probably was like, hey, if I like a lot of major league hitters, if I can handle the high fastball, it's going to be easier for me to work at the top of the zone down. Yeah. Right. So it's if I can handle that, I know I could just drop, you know, drop the barrel. The hands are going to go and, and do what they need to do. On that note, something I just thought about um, this weekend, my my I'm helping my son's team coach. And I noticed that he's a big kid. Right. He's six four, one ninety. He hit his first homer. This was in a term before he first homer 400 plus feet. Right. Just farthest ball he's ever hit. Smoked it. So he fell into a trap of, oh, I, I get, I, I can do this. So now yeah. I'm going to try to do this every, every pitch, right? So as, as I noticed, I, he had a couple strikeouts, a couple swing and misses there. And then I finally said, hey, how hard are you trying to swing? Scale of one to 10, how hard are you trying to swing? And I go, and he goes, a 10. And I go, are, are you trying to hit the ball every pitch as far as you can? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, okay. So at least you admit it, right? That's the re- the result you're getting. You're you're pulling your head a little bit. You, you're thinking that you can do hit that ball as far as you can every time. You, you're too worried about the result rather than the process of just being a good hitter first. Yeah. Right. So it, it's interesting how you said that before. Um, over swinging and, and all the little mechanics that can happen when you try to over swing. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting when you're a young 16, 17, 18 year old, still trying to learn how to hit. Yeah. It's, you know, well, I think one of the things that I remember rolling through the minor leagues and you're studying numbers and stats and all this stuff of, of okay. Like Florida state league. Okay. Yeah. And Jupiter, I hit coach the Marlins. Okay. What did the guys have to do to get out of this league? Okay, well, there were no home runs in Jupiter because a lot of guys don't hit home runs in Jupiter, right? But they 35 to 40 doubles, maybe 280, something like that, and then they, they were out. So you're trying to, to – and now those stadiums actually taught guys how to hit. Yeah. But learning to hit for power later instead of earlier, um, you got to have uh, – some of our guys like to talk about having different, you know, different tools in the toolbox, so different golf clubs in the, in the golf bag, mm-hmm. um, whether it's two strike, whether it's an RBI situation or it's, you know, three, one, I'm going to take a chance out in front. I mean, that's pretty much how you learn to hit for power. You learn to take chances out in front. You love out your swing a little bit. You learn your contact points out in front. It's not just about swinging as hard as you can. Um, but majorly, we all fall into that. Majorly players on the we coach like fall into that. Like, you're checking in with them and then like five days later, you're like, like, bro, where are you? Right. <laughs> you know, I hit that ball the other day and, and then trying to do that. And like, you hit that ball because you weren't trying to hit the ball. And then yeah. you know that as a hitter, but you, the, the competition within and the fault of the athlete always wanting to get better, right? Which is not their fault. It's not a fault, but it's just, just you got to reel it back sometimes, you know, where guys aren't feeling good. I've had players, all-star players come up to me and be like, hey, I'm taking an 0 for 4 tonight with four grounders to second base, right-handed hitter. Like, just to get, just to bring everything back, yeah. get jammed, troll it. It doesn't mean, like, I'm, I'm trying to get jammed, and, but you have to sacrifice. The season's so long, you sacrifice a couple of games. And you know what happens? They end up getting a couple hits out of it because you take the hit out of it. You know, you take the your batting average or whatever it is. Um, you end up helping the team, maybe hit a double in the gap, guy hangs a breaking ball, bam, you pull it. So there, there's so much, you, I think the things you see on the internet is just kind of like exit velocity, swing, super biomechanics, and all that's great. All that's great. If the player is ready for it, yeah. I mean, we have the guys that probably aren't ready for certain information, you know what I mean? But I got to be able to get hits, right? So I got to be able to get hits when I'm not on time, when my swing – isn't it, or I'm not on time and my swing isn't there. Can I flex out and flip or can I get jammed and, and fight it off? I don't know if that necessarily is being taught because I was talking to some guys today and I just like come up with a question of the day. Today it was like, okay, give me the percentage 
you're perfectly on time. Nobody said over 25%. Yeah, it's got to be low. On time? Like, whew, never. You know? <laughs> like, I'm never on time. I don't know how I get this. <laughs> so, it's, you know, you get the, I don't think people listen to major league players enough unless it's what society wants to hear about technology. Yeah. I think the baseball players, they're major league guys, successful guys, not just our guys, but around the league. When you see uh, YouTube videos, and guys talking about their swing, whether it's swinging down or their thought process, like, and then people are like, they don't know the swing. Like, these guys, are, these guys are geniuses. They know exactly what they're doing. I think the people outside can't get in-depth conversation with them about their swing and their thought process. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work like this or like this, but I think these things to get me on playing, beat the ball, to hit the ball in the air in a gap. So... It's just, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a hectic time for parents, and you're just trying to make them more aware of what, what the guys you see every day work on. Like Texas Rangers, I'm flipping balls to Adrian Beltre at 39 years old. He's still working on his swing. It doesn't go away. Yeah, We're working on his front side, whatever it is. That was a huge lesson for me. I'm like, everybody think they got it figured out. Like this guy's still working on his swing. It's just. You don't fix anything. You just kind of keep refining, keep refining stuff, you know, and tightening things up. Yeah, and Adrian, he's a, he was a teammate of mine with the Dodgers, and it's interesting Oof. how uh, – yeah, when the first time I saw him – in fact, I had this conversation with uh, Jeff Bannister, my former manager, and right? Yeah. Which, which, which I just realized you look a lot like Jeff Bannister. <laughs> I get, he, he would get that a lot. Like, <laughs> you're yelling, he's like – can you tell your fans to stop yelling at me yeah. post? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We get that a lot. They call me Little Banny. Little Banny. Yeah, I can little see it. Yeah. I can see it. What a mentor. What a mentor. What a mentor. Oh, he's incredible. Incredible. Yeah, so so you're doing well. Things are going well in Chicago. You're, you're a hitting coach. Um, what stories you got for us, man? You're working with big leaguers. Can you share with us whether they're funny, whether they're serious, um, when dealing with some of these hitters? Yeah, I got a few from, you know, I just remember my first job with Texas and they had just come off the 2015 championship and I get a call, you know, to interview and I get the job and I'm sitting at home and I'm like looking at their lineup and I'm like, okay, Beltre, Chu, Hamilton, Mitch Moreland, uh, Elvis Andrews, Odora was, was young, Prince Fielder, and you're like, huh. But, I'm like, what are they, they going to listen to me? Like, right. what do I do, right? Because nobody really tells you how to coach in the big leagues if you, you hadn't, you know, I didn't even play in the big leagues. I'm like, how, why would they listen to anything I had to say? So you just develop the relationships and you learn a lot of stuff and you ask a lot of questions. And it was like when Adrian just got his 3,000th hit, it was like a couple of days after that. And he was like, hey, what do you, why am I doing this? And I said, Adrian. You have 3,000 hits in the bigs. I have zero. Why are you asking me? And he's like, you're right, coach. Why am I asking you? Because he was calling the coach all the time. Hitting coach. Let's go. Hitting coach. <laughs> you know, or he would like yell, I'm there. Like, yes, Capitan. You need perfect four scene flips. Okay, here you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what, being able to have my first season of big leagues with guys like that. Um, and then we also had Ian Desmond on that team who was tremendous. You know, he was with the Nationals. And it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a cool time, and you're, you're trying to, to be yourself. I think, um, I think coming over to Chicago, you know, like you had these guys that you saw as a minor league coordinator, right? right? Like KB and, and Baez, Riz was, was already in the big leagues when I got here, Schwarber and Albert Amora, like all these players, Willie Contreras, Victor Carantini that you saw in the minor leagues and you had like these conversations where you're hugging and crying and you're trying to figure out how to get there. And then like from afar, it's 2016, you know, it was with the Rangers when they won the World Series, you're like so proud of them, you know what I mean? So I think when I first came back with the Cubs last year, um, I thanked them because um, there were some coaches who were part of the building process and scouting on um, that, that left in 2016 
and the organization gave us rings. Oh, wow. Oh, series ring. Yeah. So, you know, I remember that moment being at home on a Saturday night and, and your Theo Epstein calls and he's like, what's up? I'm like, did you butt dial me? Like, why are you FaceTiming? going on he's like no nah, i'm just calling everybody who we're giving them rings to and i was like what i looked at my wife and we were like whoa you know um uh, yeah he's like you know this, we just we want to let you know so going to wrigley field in 17 playing now we were playing the white Sox. i took the train to wrigley field to get my ring and i met randy bush and, and uh shiraz and, and they gave me the world series ring and i thought that was that was pretty cool so going into training last year was very emotional for me uh thanking them because a lot of those players are still here. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, having this, having this uh, cool monu uh, uh, moment um, in my house um, and just kind of showing people that because um, you really appreciate the stuff because you saw it when they were young. And then, uh, but the conversations with these guys, <laughs> because you know them so, you knew them since they were 19, like during a game is just like, bananas like you could people could just see like rizzo like laying on me like crushing me in a dugout and he's so big and i'm you know i'm 510 i'm like rizzo, i can't i love you man like what a beautiful day at wrigley field like i don't have a hit today it's okay it's all right look at the fans right he's trying to talk himself into yeah. not being upset being over three right now right okay don't, don't worry post <laughs> And you're like, all right, thanks, Paisan. You know, like yeah. th things like that, or like Jason Hayward. You know, is really funny in the dugout, um, really supportive of his teammates, and he's just so such a pro. Um, there was one time last year, where Javi hits this. It was like 30. It was freezing last year. You know, Wrigley. It was like 30 degrees, and I don't have the play, so I don't care. So I just put on 10 jackets. Yeah, like, I don't have to sure. care. It's like. Are you like the cold? I'm like, I'm not playing. Yeah. Like, I said the, the scan game. here. Mm -hmm. here's, here's, the iPad. here's the next picture. All right, go ahead, guys. Good luck. You know, so um, he comes in, he hits this go ahead homer, a cool game. I forgot who, who it was. And he's walking down the dugout, and I'm walking. We see each other on the bottom. And we're, we're lock, we lock eyes. I'm ready to give him a high five and a big hug. And we get about two inches from each other. And he jets out to the top step because everybody's going, ah, B, ah, B, ah, B. And he takes his helmet off and does all that. And you just see me because there's an in-dugout camera. So we played it for the players. And you just see me like, oh, okay. And, <laughs> and then he comes back and hugs me. He's like, sorry, man, I had to get out yeah. of the top step. I don't apologize to me. Like, I'm just a ball flipper, you know? Right. So. It's just those cool moments when you see guys work on something. Um, and then, it, for me, it's not even about the hitting. It's watching guys work on things and watching them accomplish it at, like, the highest level. Mm -hmm. It's uh, cool moments. But you, you know the dugout, man. You, 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 whew, you write a book on all the stuff that guys say and at the, at the moments to try and make them feel calm and in and, and the moment, you know, when you're just so, it's such a negative game, a negative sport, just kind of beat you up to th keep throwing yourself out there in front of 40,000 people, strike kind of to strike us. It's, it's not easy. You know that. You play a long time. So having a way to where, not necessarily where some, somewhere they can go to, but just knowing that, that you could air me out. You can vent on me. I will not get offended by anything you say to me because I know you're in it for the long haul. So sometimes you just need to listen as a coach. Like there's different coaching, in-game coaching and like cage coaching. Yeah. It's totally different, you know. So sometimes you just got to let the players talk and vent and they don't even – they're like, look, I don't want to hear nothing from you, but this is what I have to say. And you're like, <laughs> bring it on. I'm like, go ahead. Okay, we're good. All right, get back out there and make a play. You know, right. it's just a, it's a unique sport because no other sport practice and plays – the same day for 162 games. So people try to compare, well, you know, the health in this sport and the strength in this sport, and it's like, there's no other game like baseball for the physical and mentality of it. Do you feel like at, at your level, at the big league level, do you typically go to a player when you're seeing something or do you let them come to you? Both. Yeah. Because the, the, different, the difference for the here in the minor leagues is you got to win. So. It's not that you going to the player right away, 
makes the situation uh, better faster. You know what I mean? Because it's still baseball, right? And you, you're trying not to – Ian Desmond taught me to not be a carrier. Um, good or bad, his goal was to not be a carrier in 2016 to the next day. Like, today's a different moment. I have my routine. And, you know, we would look at each other and, like, something really good happened the day before. And we both want to talk about it. But we agreed not to be a carrier. And he was like, right. look, I don't want to be a carrier, but pretty good yesterday. That's huh? pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I acknowledge it. We acknowledge it. You acknowledge it. You're great. Like, let's go. And, you know, and he would challenge me because he'd be looking at me. And he's like, you got something for me? And I'm like, well, I don't want to be a carrier, does he? But I saw a little bit maybe open it up. He's like, okay, mm -hmm. let's go. So, um, it's just it's just challenging every day working working with the with the guys and, and I think if you establish a like or the relationship and trust right and all this stuff but it's it's real stuff you could you could go to the guys early and you could have direct conversation and I always say that in strength training when I talk to the guys I said my goal was to create that environment with freedom and not be judged right. You know, because around the turtle, you you know, you may have the GM, you may have the radio guy, and you're hitting, and you look, you're like, all these things play, and people don't understand that. I'm like, man, you guys need to go down to the bullpen and sit around the bullpen. Why does everybody go around the, the cage all the time? Yeah, right, right. So, create this environment where they had, could, could work with freedom and not be judged is, like, my main goal, um, so that they could work like that. You establish this stuff in spring training that look, I will never be offended by what you tell me because I'm in it for you, for you to get better and help the team win to win a World Series. Therefore, you should never be offended if us coach that brings something to you. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know we're in it for the same reason. So once that barrier gets done, I could go to the player with anything right away. But you also have to know your player know what in-game stuff they want to talk to. You know, this right here is, is a game changer, texting at night, calling at night on the phone. You're, you're more in contact with players now. Some players feel um, more comfortable texting. Hey, can we hit tomorrow? I'm feeling like this. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so you just kind of have to adapt uh, as, as you get older because one of the cool things that I was coaching before the iPhone, yeah. you know, so, so and it was just kind of video and stats and then so you you see the the evolution the progress of it so you have this kind of this experience of being able to coach with like so much little stuff but still see tremendous great players and you have all this other technology stuff guys are still good anyway regardless of whether we have it or not <laughs> right you know so it's just establishing that you could have honest and tough conversations and hug it out you could go you could go to the player early and and they won't wait as long either They'll come to you earlier um, because maybe they finally go, okay, I don't have it figured out. And I like to use all our staff too. Like I know some coaches don't like to do that. Like, cause I'm in the dugout or I'm in the cage. I don't, the first base coach will Venable uh, last year. Will was the first base coach this year. He's, he's the third base coach. I use will all the time. Like, cause he'll ask me, is like so-and-so working on something. I'm like, why is that? He looks different from my angle. Right. Cause he's, you know what I mean? So you you, you got to use your, your corner coaches and you got to use your BP throwers, right? Because I'll always ask them, what do you see? What do you, what do you got? Eh, not so good, good. We, maybe we get away from that, move on to that. So Because they're throwing to them every day. I mean, no, they know exactly what they want to work on and all that stuff. So using your other coaches to, to help you get to the player, to me, I'm, I, I'm, I'm all on board on that. Absolutely. You guys have – you mentioned BP throwers. Every team was a little bit different <clears throat> in my experience. Do you guys have guys that come in and throw BP or is it mainly the coaches? Not anymore. It's mainly, it's mainly the coaches. You, you know, I was in Texas. We, we had a, a coach that would come in at home as an extra arm and stuff like that. But if, yeah. you're, if you're fortunate enough to have coaches who could throw a good BP, and we got some A-plus guys this year. Um, so, and, and, you know, you just – Anything else? You get a couple of hits, you know, the big guys on the team are like, he's throwing my group today. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Like, yeah. And then everybody else is like, dang it, you know, the veteran guys. I'm like, well, someday you'll be there. If you play long enough, buddy, you can do whatever you want. Like, right. it's the senior citizen discount. Like, senior citizens go get discount on food and everything else because they lived a long life. 
They lived through it. That's so right. You haven't said anything yet. You can't answer your BP thrower. You can't do heat today, as a matter of fact. How about that? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So you're in your National League team. It's going to be a little bit different now. We got the DH, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. are the are the pitchers pissed off? Or are they happy? Yeah. Yep. Um, it's, <laughs> I love I love our pitchers. They compete at the plate. Like, yeah. Jeff Lester, Kyle Hendricks. You know, last year we had Cole Hamels, uh, Chatty Chatwood. Man, he come he pinch hits for us last year. Got some big knocks to start rallies. Uh, so Q Quintana, like. Not a very good hitter. Nothing against Q. He works his butt off, right? Yeah. So I see Q. I said, you, you excited? I mean, you disappointed? And he's like, yeah, I'm really excited. I said, not me. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're not hitting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. I do watching the pitchers uh, practice. They compete against each other. Like right before RBP at home, the pitchers would hit and watching, you know, Johnny and Kyle and Q. Uh, you, Darvish, and, and just watching them really compete in batting practice because they, they're still working at it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Asking you questions. And I'm like, dude, just, just put, put the bat on the ball. Like, yeah. But <laughs> the DH, and Johnny hit an Apple homo last year. So he's like, you know, I have the highest slug on the team right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, it's, it's exciting for us because. Um, you know, with Victor Carantini behind the play, we can, you know, Schwarber, Rizzo, like we can get some guys off their feet in the 60 game sprint, short sprint training. You know, you could, we could use the DH. For us, I think it totally benefits our lineup because we're, we're pretty deep. Right. So uh, just being able to move some guys who are very versatile defensively. Um, so I don't know how it's going to go next year. I don't know if they've already, if they're already decided on what they do, but I think eventually over time it's, it's probably going to go away, and it's going to probably be the DH because the pitches are just – it just keeps getting worse because see, everybody's afraid they're going to get hurt. They work yeah. on bleak and all this. So, um, I love the National League game. Sure. Being able to do and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's exciting for us to, to see the DH for the short time. Yeah. Now, do you – as a – because I remember, like, pitchers would come in. If you're at home, they would – the pitchers would hit first before the team would strike. Yeah. I'm assuming that still would be the same routine. Same. Yeah. Right? Do, do you work with the pitchers as a hitter with hitting, or do they kind of just do their own thing and, like, good, good luck? We yeah, should. no, Tommy, Tommy Hadovy, the pitching coach, um, and we have some guys go out there. Sledge will go out there, our assistant hitting coach, or one of the other coaches. You know, it's, it's, it's what's the, what does the manager want? Yeah. You know, so. What what is what is like last year working with Joe? What do you what do you want, Joe? Like you go out if you want to go out there and tell them like so I go in the cage with the you know with the, with the hitters and you know and Rossi well, not this year because we won't have it but just what the manager wants and the expectations from the pitcher to have a good at bat to be able to bump to be able to um, you know uh, bump and run around third and get them in and just kind of maneuver the barrel with the ball in play because there's so many holes. Um, and how important that is. So I think it's more from the manager than it is the, the hitting coach um, because you don't want them taking millions of swings in the cage and doing that type of stuff. Like, they got things that I need you to take the ball and get guys out. You yeah. know, like, we're, we'll take care of the hitting. It was challenging in the American League because you don't hit, right? So now you're counting the days. Okay, we're like three weeks away from we're playing in Philly. Let's start getting the starters, you know, off the tee and just getting their body acclimated. Yeah. To, and then we have to figure out what relievers might hit. And then as we ramp up, they start taking BP. We go on the road. You know, we do, you know, we get there early um, and do that. And at home, we, we hit them early. So the American League was, was way more of a, of a challenge. Because, like, if you have a guy that has never swung the bat before, you're putting them in the major league. Hitters can't even hit major league pitching, yeah, right? You know, so that's a whole inning. <laughs> if the guy gets a – that's an inning. You, yeah. you're, now you're on innings because you're giving the other team three outs. So it's just an unfair advantage. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, I, I find it's going to be interesting if they decide to go that route and just eliminate the pitcher and just kind of go all DH. I, I certainly see that trend kind of leaning toward that. Um, these pitchers are making so much money and um, yeah. trying, trying to, get, I guess, just keep them safe and from getting injured. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, the, it's just the, the, you, if you look at the numbers of the pitcher hitting, it's a huge decline. Like mm-hmm. the, the number 
or average on base, whatever you want to look at LPS. Yeah. It's just not good. So yeah. it's like, okay, are we doing this? What, what are we doing? So you just, as the game evolves, you just keep trying to make adjustments. Yeah. Well, I'll ask you one more question here. You, you mentioned about the assistant hitting coaches. So that, that's something that is new toward Major League Baseball. I mean, it's a few years old now. Tell us what an assistant hitting coach does. Keeps the hitting coach sane. <laughs> Sledge, Sledge is awesome because he uh, – and I'll just talk about Sledge and then I'll get into the role. But Sledge, you know, he played in the big leagues, um, played in Japan, had a really cool career in Japan. So he has these unique perspectives on everything. Um, when he first got into coaching, we hired him um, for our short season team. So I knew him from 2013 or 14. And then the Dodgers picked him up. They sent him right to Double A, and he was able to work with all those, all those young players through the Dodgers and, and work some stuff. Whether it's whether it was technology or KBS sports play, whatever it is you want to talk about, he was already equipped with a lot of stuff. But I think with 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 the assistant hitting coach, I hate saying I hate saying the word assistant. You know, I can't. It's it's hard for me because yeah. you're in it together, right? So. You know, it's just it gives you a different set of eyes. Like, there's so much to cover now for the hitting coach than just being in the cage, putting ball on the tee, and, and talking about plan or approach about the pitcher. Because um, you know, you have data, you have technology, um, dealing with the R and D department. Like, you, sometimes, sometimes there's days like I'm not in the cage. I'm, I'm talking to different people, and Sledge and Juan Cabrera um, really pick up that slack for me mm -hmm. on the physical side of it. Um, but just, just being there, giving – because I, I don't – I can't give – okay, this is where I think, like, where's there, where's there like, a little bit of a clash, right? You played in the big leagues, you didn't play in the big leagues, you don't know, you know, like, I played 11 years in the minor leagues. I cannot give what the perspective is of 40,000 people digging my spikes in the dirt at Wrigley Field. i never done it. Sometimes a player needs that. So you send them to Sledge or you send them to David Ross or who we – also, his quality assurance coach, Mike Napoli, he's hanging out in the cages all the time. And that was incredible. We worked together in Texas. So they could give that unique perspective of being in the, I could tell you what it's like to sit in a AAA box and not feel confident. You yeah. know what I mean? Sure. But it's, not the, it's still not the same as the, as the big leagues where TV's on you, social media's destroying you, all these type of things. You know, that's, I think, where Sledge comes in, Nap comes in, and gives these perspective to help these, help these players out. Um, that I can't give, mm -hmm. you know. What I mean? So, and we're very fortunate too. Like during spring training, Billy Williams, stud, yeah, you know, Evan Euclid comes in, um, Andre Dawson, even even our guys like Rick Sutcliffe, like come in the cage, like talk to these guys about your your experiences in the big leagues, you know, and you like felt terrible, but you still had to go out and compete. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the things that I want our guys constantly hearing especially from former Cub guys who deal with the day games at Wrigley Field. So uh, as far as that, I, I, again, try to use everybody, but, but uh, with Sledge is just really, he takes a lot off my plate. It's just as far little things like groups, BP arms, it may, it may seem little, but it's big because it does take your time away from, um, from certain players or things. You got to study, you know, I'm studying the starting pitcher, the relievers with our, with our advanced scout mate who's tremendous. Um, and we get together and formulate some type of team, a more individual plan for each guy. But each guy now has – each guy could type in their name versus matchup and find their own information. So your yeah, advanced – that's amazing. Yeah, your advanced yeah. meetings aren't as depth anymore, at least for me, because they just look it up. And our guys are very good at doing their due diligence. You see them – you go in the video room, you see them on an iPad. Like, what are you doing on your iPad right now? And then they show me the matchups of who they're facing that night. So mm -hmm. things are a lot shorter, a short, shorter now. Um, I just try to stay only like 18 minutes, like TED Talk. You know, yeah. I mean, like, like keep it, keep it, and, you know, today's because you just keep them, you try to keep them going to the next, to the next thing. So um, I think you definitely need an assistant, assistant hitting coach or two hitting coaches. Um, but I also think um, in hiring that person, it has to be somebody who. They feed off each other. Yes, absolutely. That front office is sometimes they can just put two people together and have it work out, and it doesn't. But if you have that 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 energy between each other, that when that first guy walks out of the cage, and they the players feel that energy from the connection from the coaches. They're going to feel not safer, but freer to work on their on their craft. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to imagine too. Like 
just being able to go to play, coach A or B, that they're, you're teaching the same thing probably, you're probably on the same page, yeah. but one guy might be able to communicate or share a message yeah. that maybe that guy doesn't. And Yeah, this, we hire and fire ourselves with the players all the time. So say I flip to – or the big one is funny with Victor, Victor Carantini. Like, I flip the boss, he never gets any hits. So he's like, no more, no more you. Yeah, so you're out. Like, yeah, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Players have, have fun with it too. Like, they'll walk by and they'll tell slash, slash, done, no more. No more flips. Like, yeah, I'm 0 for 15. And it's just kind of, you know, just a different perspective and nobody has any egos on it because we're all sure. the same thing. So um, every player does not have to come in the cage with me. I think that's a – we have multiple coaches down there. So I see what's going on. You understand what guys are working on. You watch a video with them. You're talking about their session throughout the day, whether it's lunch or whether we're having conversations all the time. Like, they don't need to come through the, the major league hitting coach cage. You know, sure. I don't want them to because I'll, I'll go insane. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, well, that's awesome, man. This has been incredible. Yeah. I think it's it's great to hear insight um, from the guys that are down and dirty, right? They're, you're with them every single day. Um, <clears throat> any advice that you can give? You, you mentioned a lot of it in our earlier conversation, but say a high school, college player, uh, from a hitting standpoint, any advice that you would want to give them? I guess more on the mental side of things of hitting. Yeah, I think the question I get asked a lot is how do you get a guy out of this? Huh. And I got asked that the other day, like, how do you get a guy out of a 60 game slump compared to, and I said, well, one, we don't really use that word. That's more for you guys, for the media. And two, like, if I can know how to get a guy out of a slump, he would never be in one. You know, like, we would never let it get that far. So I think really getting to the root of, of why a guy may be, may be struggling, you know, talking with our guys in the cage, and it could be the same thing for college or even high school, like, you know, uh, high school, my parents are spending so much money on lessons. I'm not doing too good. There's anxiety and there's pressure right there. And try, how do you ease that off the player and, and take that, take the selfishness away? Um, because we've created the most selfish player in the history of baseball in the last five years, you know, through, through all this stuff. So um, in college, it could be like the first time you're not playing, right? And now you get in there and you have a lot of anxiety because you want to stay in the lineup figure out like you really got to dig down deep to figure out why I got to struggle. Our guys, the big leagues, it's like, I just got told I'm platooning. Now his work stinks, you know, right? For like five days, right? He's trying to figure out maybe I should be traded and all these things. He's just trying to get him focused on the, on the process of, of being like right centered here. How can you get better right now? Um, as far as the swing thing and mechanical thing, I would really suggest like quality contact all around the field, hit the ball as hard as you can. Um, don't just be one dimensional. What, what we're seeing that has reached a big, big, big level is like we call it a one trick pony swing. Okay. So you're able to do one thing, right? Everything has to be perfect. The ball has to be in the right area. Not being able to do multiple swing planes or swing paths. Um, I like guys in batting practice, believe it or not, to swing at everything. And I learned that from, from roving. Um, I remember I was in AAA and my first trip, I'm in Las Vegas, I'm throwing BP and I'm like, I didn't know I was so good, VP, but everybody at AAA could, like, barrel right. everything. And yeah. So from to go to Lansing, low way, man, guys are taking, hitting <laughs> stuff on the top of the cage, they're late, and I'm like, I just threw a money, and what, I'm, what I found out is it's like, okay, it's not me, it's, a, it's the players. So I think, like, players learn how to maneuver the barrel in certain areas because they're going to chase, they're going to hit with two strikes, they're going to get hit and runs, you know, if they still do that. So learning, you're going to be out in front. You can't do that by taking all the time in batting practice. So learning to hit multiple pitches outside the zone. But the best hitters I see know the zone, but they also can hit pitches out of the zone yes. um, when, when needed. So uh, batting practice for me now is like, stop taking, bro. Like, you, I, I see you swing out in the dirt in the game. If it's low, you better take that scoop it up and stay through the middle of the field. Right. Like, don't tell me that's a ball and BP. I see you swing out in the game. So let's go. So just, just kind of things like that. And also just to really get to the – really find a way to get to the person. Like, if you, if you can get to the guy as a, as a human being and help him off the field, especially high school, college, because 
only a certain amount of percentage play pro ball. And I'm always trying to figure out ways to get guys to bring their, their, uh, their, I hate saying real life, but their real life into their hitting and their hitting into their, yeah. their real, you know what I mean? Cause there's so many lessons in the batter's box um, that they can take with them after baseball. So just really trying to educate guys in baseball, but also how to just be successful after baseball as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been great, man. This is yeah, man. Very informative. You, you mentioned yeah, whatever you want. Before I call, you're you're four blocks away. You walked to Wrigley Field. Yeah. I mean, that's that. I had I had two months that I spent with the Cubs at Wrigley Field, and and man, yeah. it was special. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Who we'll walk? Because you know, right where the Harry Carey thing is, I turn the corner and walk, and then you know, the stadiums hit you every time. It does not it does get old. And then, like, on the, you say, you say for a night game, I get there, say 11, I'm trying to do a workout, stay ahead of stuff. And that W flag still up from the night before. I have so many pictures I just take from underneath it as on, on, by Murphy's Corner. It's just, you know, it does not get old. It yeah. doesn't get old. That's the best venue in sports. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, man, I wish you the best of luck. Good luck. Yeah, you know, got eight days, opening day. And I'm <laughs> We probably won't see you. You'll have your mask on, you know. I, I don't. <laughs> I'll have to do something. I'll have to do something. I'll text you and something like, "Look for me in the dugout." I mean, I don't know. I don't yeah. figure out a new. Something, but. <laughs> you need to get some yeah. type of cool mask that that makes you stand out. Neon, <laughs> neon, neon, like a neon green or a pink, something like that. Oh man, I don't know neon. Man. I don't know. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, best of luck okay. to you, and we'll chat with you soon, man. I appreciate you coming on. Awesome, brother. Okay, take care of yourself. Yeah. Hey, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that with Anthony. That was pretty awesome. He's got some great stories there. Man, to be a hitting coach in the big leagues, pretty good gig, right? Hey, if you need any extra help in regards to your mental game, if you are a parent and you know your son or daughter needs that extra edge, make sure you visit mentaledge.training. I am personally coaching athletes one-on-one. -on -one. I'm doing team calls and I have a video vault. If you have a kid that doesn't really want to do one-on-one -on -one calls, the video vault is for you. I'm going to be starting live Zoom calls weekly as well. So make sure you check the notes in this YouTube video and I will see you in the next episode. Thanks.